Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast edition. I am really pleased to introduce you to two people who know the mask mandate case inside and out because they fought it in Florida and won. Uh, Leslie Manukian of the Health Freedom and Defense Fund. She's president of the Health Freedom and Defense Fund, healthfreedomdefense.org. And my friend, Brant Hathaway, who you might remember as the uh, guy behind Strange Women Lying in Ponds, which was one of the one of the great original blogs in the blogosphere. He's at the Davalier Law Group, davalierlawgroup.com. And um, Brant and Leslie, thank you so much for being with us today. It's our pleasure, Ed. Good to see you. And uh, Leslie, let's start with you. Health Freedom Defense Fund decides to challenge the CDC mask mandate for transit systems. This is all of the different transit systems that it applies. Uh, we know it mostly through, you know, the, you know, flying in airlines, but it also applies to any other, um, any other transit that crosses state lines. What, what made you decide to challenge this? Even more than that, it actually also applies to any kind of transportation service that takes federal funds. So like my local free bus service, they were requiring masks as well because they take, they took CARES Act funds. Oh, wow. So, okay. um, you know, the impetus behind it all was just that as soon as 2020 started to unfold, I could see where this was headed. I've been involved in health freedom for many, many years, a couple decades. I made an award-winning documentary on vaccines. I suffered my own vaccine reaction, having believed 100% that they were the greatest invention of mankind and that there was no downside. And it just taught me the importance of bodily autonomy. It taught me the importance of liberty for all. It taught me the importance of actually appropriately checked government. And so I started Health Freedom Defense Fund and we, Brandt and I, and the rest of the legal team really felt that the mask mandate was one of the most egregious violations of federal law, but also that it was the kind of tip of the spear when it comes to infringing our health freedoms. And if they could successfully literally mask muzzle every American or almost everyone, then we were going to have a really serious, even more serious problem in our hands than we already do. And so we felt that it was a really important thing to challenge, but challenge because of that. Brent, what was it that attracted you to this case and, and, and to, and to challenging this? Because I mean, in, in the initial phase, right, it's an emergency the government gets a lot of flex from courts, usually in emergencies. And we saw this in some other cases that went to the Supreme court, but you know, this thing's getting, <laughs> wearing on to two years. And um, I mean, I know that I would expect at some point that they'd at least try to get this through the administrative procedure <laughs> act properly right. um, if they're going to keep extending this. But I mean, I think your involvement on this was just something a little bit more than an APA violation here. Right. Well, as you know me from way back when, when we were blogging, I'm very much a constitutional conservative. I believe strongly in our constitutional order. And I've become increasingly concerned with, as Mark Levin has so aptly put it over the years, uh, uh, that the fact that we sort of reached a post-constitutional phase of our republic, where more and more power is not only accrued in the federal government, but it seems to be accruing in the executive branch itself and in government agencies. And with this mask mandate, uh, it was clearly to me a political decision because remember when biden came into office the covid pandemic had been going for a year it had been almost a year to the day since the trump administration had declared a national emergency and on biden's first full day in office and, and i should go back and, and and no you'll recall he made a campaign promise of instituting some sort of national mask mandate when it was on the campaign trail and so right. this was the fulfillment of a campaign promise, not a, uh, a not science. I mean, the CDC existed before the Biden administration, but he ins he entered this executive order uh, requiring uh, or instructing the uh, CDC, TSA, and FAA to implement rules requiring the wearing of masks on conveyances, and that extended to you know all manner of non personal. Uh, travel conveyances as well as transportation hubs and the CDC without going through notice and comment entered this rule and it was published in the Federal Register about two weeks later and 
the reasoning behind avoiding notice and comment was in the rule it said the the ongoing public health emergency well as i said it had been ongoing for a year and so there was no reason at that point to avoid notice and comment uh, but more over as 2021 went on there were a number of decisions that came out uh limiting the scope of the statute that cdc had relied on it relied on the same statute when it implemented the uh, eviction moratorium and also when it uh, implemented this uh, conditional sale order that basically shut down the cruise industry. Right. And the courts were, you know, pretty consistent saying, well, wait a second, this statute is not as broad as you say it is, CDC. And the the cruise uh, line opinion from Judge Mary Day of the Middle District in Tampa was particularly useful because it addressed you know, the application to the travel industry to some extent and, and said, look, this, this statutory provision you're relying on applies to animals and articles and things. And other courts said it, it applied to property, not people. So it, and there were the other subsections of the statute uh, detailed the limits of the CDC's quarantine authority, which applied to people. So it was pretty clear that the statutory scheme was laid out so that this section they relied on 42 usc section 264a was really geared toward uh things and not persons and the court agreed with both prongs one that it, it didn't apply to this this word sanitation uh in, in terms of the way it was meant in the statute and and that it you know the, the statute only applied to articles things and property plus the apa the administrative procedure act right. which is which is you know it's sort of a common failing um, in 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 the executive branch to um, you know to to sort of skip over steps that uh, courts deem fairly significant. And Leslie, I want to I want to get back to you because I, I read the ruling, and I think a lot of the people who criticized this have not read the ruling, right? And 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 Leslie clearly agrees with me on this. But it's a fifty nine page ruling. It is a very clear ruling. It's very detailed. And, and I think it speaks, the, the pushback on this speaks to uh, not the, you know, not the uh, substance of this ruling, but the impact on the unlimited power that people want the CDC to have. And I think this gets back to your original, uh, your original um, impetus for challenging this. I mean, do you feel vindicated just from the fact of how people are criticizing this ruling? Well, first of all, I had to, I just have to say when when Brant call, called me on Monday morning and told me he's like, "Are you sitting down?" And I mean, I jumped for joy, and I jumped for joy for so many reasons. One, because we won, of course. But right. secondly, then in the afternoon, we just saw. Well, as soon as the ruling um, was released, we started to be inundated with texts and emails of videos and photographs of people, you know ripping their masks off and flight attendants dancing in the aisles and um, flight attendants singing and passengers and crying. They were weeping. They, they, crying, they, they, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think, I mean, for me, a mask feels incredibly dehumanizing. It's, it's, it's really, it's uncomfortable for me. I have some medical issues which make it very, very challenging for me. But on top of that, there's just the humanity of it that bothers me, right? right. I mean, I want to see people's faces. I want to smile at them. I want to engage. I mean, it's just, it's, it's what we are. We're social creatures. And it literally, I felt it was really dehumanizing. So when this happened, it was a relief. But the bigger thing was just how big of a relief it was nationwide. And then speaking specifically to your question, I think it's so important, you know, we were all taught when we were in grade school that we have three branches of government, right? The executive, the legislative, and the judicial. The ju judicial. And what's really interesting to me is that I don't think most Americans understand that there's this kind of fourth branch that, you know, resides underneath the executive, but it's unaccountable and unelected. And there's almost nothing we can do about them. And it's just growing and growing in power and strength. And one of the things that has really been a thorn in my side since the very beginning of COVID is the mantra, trust the experts, trust the experts. And I think it's really important to remind people that the experts brought us Vioxx. They brought us the opioid crisis. They brought us x-raying pregnant women's pelvises. 
The truth is that nobody is better positioned to determine what's best for each and every one of us than ourselves. Right. And an out of control executive branch, unaccountable to the electorate, is something that all Americans from any position on the political spectrum should fear. And so I think it was a, an extremely gratifying decision for that reason as well, because I think in some ways we really struck a blow to the administrative state. And I think that's a really important thing if we care about this country, the rule of law and preserving our freedoms and the accountability of government. So I'm you know, thrilled with it all. We're speaking with Leslie Manukian from the Health Freedom Defense Fund, healthfreedomdefense.org, and Brant Hadaway, my friend from DavalierLawGroup.com, formerly of Strange Women Lying in Ponds. I'm never going to let I'm never going to let that uh, that that memory has to stay clear. But I want to stick with Leslie here because I want to follow up on on something you just said. I mean, and and getting back to the point of what the actual criticism of this was, because I think you're you're right. I mean, what we were hearing was from people was. Well, this isn't uh, Dr. Fauci, for instance, Anthony Fauci went on television a couple of appearances and said this shouldn't be decided by courts. This should be decided by experts. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, my, my, my co-blogger, all about all uh, pundit said that this was the the worst Fauci soundbite yet of the pandemic for the very reasons that you're talking about, which is uh, separation of powers, judicial oversight and clearly this is, I mean, this, there wasn't, what, did you even hear a substantive response to this that said the, the mask mandate is critical for managing this pandemics because X, other than just the power argument? Let me tell you a couple things so that I think are really important to understand. First of all, 65% of the drug approver salaries at FDA are paid directly by the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, they pay user fees. The CDC takes money from the pharmaceutical industry and vested interests like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They took about $300 million last year. On top of that, NIH earns, in the last, I believe, 30 years, they've earned about $2 billion in royalties on the intellectual property to um, patents you know, for the intellectual property they've, they've developed. And I'm sharing this because they are piling on Judge Catherine Mazel. And they're doing that because I don't think they want the public to know what's really going on, which is that these industry, these agencies have been captured by the industry they're supposed to regulate. And so, you know, the best defense is a good offense, right? right. <laughs> they're going after Judge Mazel, saying she's too pretty. Now, of course, when, when President Trump, when then candidate Trump criticized his opponent, he was right, rightfully, um, he criticized female opponent's appearance. He was rightfully condemned for doing so by the media but the media has been silent on this and in fact they're engaging in this they're calling her too pretty too young she's a trump appointee she's conservative all these kinds of things when all of the cases were going to the ninth circuit to try and um uh attack president trump during his um during his presidency nobody was calling out what the uh, partisan leanings of those judges were or anything like that. And yet they're piling on this. And I think that what it really speaks to is that they don't have a lot to argue. And so they're resorting to ad hominem attacks. And I think that they're very concerned. The DOJ has said specifically that they want to preserve the power and authority of CDC. That was one of their primary um, points in the statement that they released. And then Fauci the other day specifically said, you know, we need to preserve this authority. And, you know, we can't have, he said, we can't have judges, these like judges and courts overruling public health authorities. This is a problem. I think they're just doing it, you know, going after her and criticizing her without having any understanding. The other point I would make, Ed, which I think is really important, my own local newspaper somehow construed that we were claiming that the CDC was using police powers. OK, and they were doing this to make us look like alarmists or to twist what we're really arguing. And the truth is that the Constitution reserves police powers to the states specifically. Right. And part of the police powers are the health powers. OK, and so we didn't argue that the CDC was. Um, you know, deploying police powers the way that they wanted to make it sound right. They want to make it sound extremists that were crazies. 
what we said was that they were overstepping their statutory authority and that they were usurping power that's been reserved to the states. And this is another thing. And so they don't have anything to say about the substance of our arguments. And so they resort to these really inappropriate and frankly, um, misogynist criticisms of Judge Mazel, who, if you ask me, the best word to describe her, her ruling was meticulous. Meticulous. It's incredible. Meticulous, meticulously, um, meticulously crafted. Even if you disagree with the uh, with with her definition of sanitation, which I think yeah. is going to be the basis of an appeal, I'm going to talk to Brandt about that in a second. Um, she did her homework and she followed Brandt the script that was basically laid out in the eviction moratoria. I mean, this is nobody should be surprised by the outcome of of this um of this case right after after watching right. what the supreme court did with the eviction moratoria yeah it would what i think happened here was that when cdc instituted the mandate they didn't yet have the benefit of these decisions that were percolating in the courts uh construing that statute the the main the only significant case that had preceded this was back, I think, in the 70s or 80s, and it concerned uh, a case in Louisiana ban where the FDA relied on the same statute to ban the interstate sale of these little pet turtles, you may remember, almost right. everybody had had the back in the 70s to stop the spread of salmonella. And the court then focused on the first sentence of the statute, which is quite broad, uh, and say, well, you know, the power here is quite broad, and, and so this seems to fall within it, and that's okay. But then after the mandate was, was entered, you, you had the eviction moratorium cases, which were going through more than percolating up through the, the district courts and the circuit courts. And then you had this cruise line case that dealt with the same uh, provision of the statute. And the Supreme Court ended up affirming what the lower courts were saying, which is, well, wait a second, there's a second sentence of the statute that is under the doctrine of a words are known by the company they keep that really narrows the scope of the first sentence. And so you have to have measures that are like these enumerated measures in the second sentence, of the, which, which included things like inspection, sanitation, uh, fumigation, disinfection, and these are all actions that you take and apply to things, animals, and objects, not people. And, and, and any, in any event, it, if you're going to do something, CDC, your, your power, your authority to do anything is governed by these words or, or words that are kind of similar to those words. And so by the time we got to briefing this case, the government was kind of stuck. And they, they and just what to me was a, a classic example of post hoc rationale, they seized onto the word sanitation, said, okay, well, masks are a sanitation measure. And they relied on this di dictionary definition of sanitation. We actually went back and looked at the contemporaneous uh, regulations, the international regulations and US regulations under that statute, uh, you know, basically saying what sanitation was, sanitary inspection, and, and they were things like, you know, de-ratting, disinsecting, uh, and fumigating. And, you know, these are all things you do to, for example, the ship that arrives at a port that's suspected of harboring uh, in, infected uh, animals or something like that. And, and so, you know, the judge agreed with us, this is not sanitation. And in any event, this, this section of the statute doesn't apply to people. So I'm going to throw this to both of you. Um, are you surprised to hear that the Biden administration is going to appeal this through the Department of Justice and the CDC in light of the fact that, politically speaking, it probably benefits everybody if the mandate goes away at this point? Um, I'll, let, right. I'll, let, I'll let both of you address that, however you want to address it. Sure. I, you know, it didn't surprise me because I think what they're concerned about the, the mandate isn't coming back right now it, it, if they were concerned about preserving the mandate they would have moved for an emergency stay uh, to try to stay judge Mizell's ruling they didn't do that it's obvious that something else is afoot here i i think that on its face what they what they've said publicly is what i think is the reason is they want to 
try to claw back what they believe to be the CDC's institutional authority to do this or things very much like this. Uh, but it remains to be seen whether they're actually going to prosecute this appeal. I, I suspect there may be some other procedural shenanigans in the works, but we'll have to wait and see after May 3rd. Leslie, what's your thought on that? <laughs> I think it's a, a really interesting move. Um, as Brant mentioned, they didn't file right away. And then they, and they also, of course, never even implemented the mask mandate for a year into the crisis, which is very peculiar if it's so pressing. Um, I think that they are kind of stuck between a hawk, a rock and a hard place, right? If they don't appeal, then it looks like they don't stand behind the mandate. And if they do appeal, then they um, risk actually having another ruling against them and a, even more, um, you know, solidifying the, the precedent that's been set with this ruling. And so I wasn't totally surprised, but I also thought it was a little bit, um, I don't know, I have to say humorous because <laughs> I feel in some ways they scored an own goal. Right, right. Um, yeah. You know, for people who don't know soccer, that's when somebody on your team kicks the ball into their own goal. And in some ways, you know, their initial statement was, well, we're going to wait and see what CDC does or concludes in its, its assessment of the situation. Well, that right there says there's no emergency, because if there's an emergency, you don't wait for days or weeks for an assessment, you move immediately. And so I wonder if DOJ realizes that this is problematic for them and they kind of threw CDC under the bus a little bit. And then CDC wants to preserve their authority and then DOJ is like, okay, we'll go forward. So I think it's a little bit, <laughs> I mean, it made me chuckle. I have to say that. And another interesting thing just about the political dynamic is that I heard through the grapevine from DOJ that nobody outside DOJ knew about this case. And so when it erupted last Monday, it must have really caused a, a great deal of surprise and consternation in the administration. Uh, and I think there was that sort of disorientation you saw uh, for a few days while the administration got its bearings. It was very interesting to watch. Well, the whole thing's been interesting to watch, right? Yes. I mean, and, yes. so, I mean, and, and to get to Leslie's point and to throw, I'll throw it to Brant first and get back to, and, and have Leslie address this as well. I mean, clearly, if they really want to fix this problem, if they really want to, you know, salvage the CDC's authority to act in this manner, the the correct procedure would be to go to Congress to either A, amend the enabling statute for CDC, the Title 42 enabling statute, to, to add this authority, or B, simply have Congress pass a mask mandate on its own and have it based on CDC recommendations. Nobody seems to be doing that, though, Brent. Um, and the reason is uh, kind of the same reason that we have agency law in the first place. Congress doesn't want the responsibility. Exactly, exactly. And, I, you know, that's the whole subtext here to this uh, whole dispute and, and the related disputes that have occurred with respect to other CDC and, and agency mandates during this pandemic is that at some point the courts need to hold Congress's feet to the fire and say, look, you need to do your job. The, the framers put Article One in, put Congress in Article One because it is the first and most important power of the federal government is that is to write laws. And nobody in the media is talking about that, which is to me fascinating. In less time than it takes for this case to wend its way up uh, through the 11th Circuit and, and perhaps the Supreme Court, Congress could easily say, you know what, CDC, you're right. We meant to give you that power. We're going to pass a law amending the Public Health Service Act to clarifying that you do have that power going forward. Or as you say, institute, uh, you know, specifically authorizing mask mandates uh, under certain circumstances, right? Then we can have a discussion about whether that's constitutional. That's another question. Right. Uh, but Congress could do that. And, but nobody's talking about it. I think there's, so, <laughs> I think there's more to it though. It's not just that they don't want the responsibility. It's also that the responsibility is not the, theirs. It does not belong to them, right? Of, for, and by the people. Our rights are granted by our creator, not by Congress, not by CDC, not by anybody else. 
I think that's so important for all of us to keep in mind. And the last thing I want is Congress to go and assert more power than it already has. So I think we should really tread very lightly on that. Sure, they could fix it that way, but that's not a fix that any liberty loving American would embrace in my, in my view. But I think they have another problem too, Ed, and that is this, CDC's own meta-analysis, meaning a big review of 14 randomized controlled trials published in May of 2020, specifically showed. So it, it evaluated the impact of masking on the spread of influenza viruses, hand, enhanced hygiene, so hand washing, mm -hmm. and environmental sanitation, meaning you know cleaning surfaces and things like this. It, right. it evaluated all three of those things. 14 randomized controlled trials, the gold standard in, in scientific research. And you know what they found? Uh, no, I'm gonna, yeah, mass so no really significant do it, impact for many of those measures. Yeah. So it is very telling to me that CDC did not submit a body of science in support of their mandate. They didn't submit a single randomized controlled trial. And uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, I think that's important because you can make the argument two years ago that they're implementing this as a mitigating um, factor because they didn't have anything else. And this, they just simply couldn't do the science that quickly, right? And they didn't have a vaccine. They didn't have, they didn't have therapeutics and all this kind of stuff. We didn't really know what the virus was doing yet. So you can make an argument that, well, it's an emergency. They're do going to do that. And courts, Brand, I'm, I'm sure would concur, would likely um, allow them some leeway on that. But you've got two years, you've got science now on this, and they still haven't demonstrated this. David Leonhardt, I'm going to throw this back to Leslie first. David Leonhardt, the New York Times, who's been actually a pretty rational reporter on this, wrote the same thing you just said, is that <laughs> we've got studies, and yeah, in theory, this is supposed to work, but in practice, there's no difference between mask mandate and non-mask mandate communities. Yeah, they knew this in May of 2020. I need to yeah. emphasize that. They published that study, a ran, uh, 14 study meta-analysis. They knew darn well. What they did though, was then manufacture what are called mechanistic studies. And what that means is, instead of observing what actually happens in the real, real world as a result of these measures, they went and shot spittle, liquid, mucus and things out of a gun towards a piece of fabric. And they found that, hey, wow, yeah, holy mackerel, it stops the spittle from flying. But that doesn't mean anything about spread, especially when you're looking at an aerosolized virus and that's what we're dealing with. And so um, they've known for a century that masks don't have any impact. The Washington Post itself wrote that they knew in the Spanish flu that masks didn't have any impact. It's, it's not that they don't have the science, it's that I think that they wanted a public policy to support something political rather than because of a, a scientific reason. Yeah, I'm just... this, their urge to be seen doing something is, you know, what drives so much of our politics these days. That uh, David Leonhardt article really made an important point, which we mentioned in our briefing, which is that, you know, suddenly requiring tens, if not hundreds of millions of laymen to don uh, personal protective equipment, uh, which are medical devices, and instantly know how to use them and what's appropriate and stuff. It, it's really, it's really not a realistic thing to expect that it's going to work. And the, and the WHO had actually said back, I think it was during the H1N1 epidemic back in 2009, 2010, that, you know, requiring people to wear a mask can actually backfire because of the way, you know, people don't use them properly and so forth. And so uh, there was that aspect of it, which, you know, to me was also very troubling, but, but kind of comical in a way. Well, Brent, yeah, I, I, it, it's a false sense of security, which is one of the things that um, David Leonhardt writes, which is, you know, it's it, it's not doing much, but people are, are, are relying on it as though it does. And right. I'd argue that there might be some mild mitigation from wearing masks. My wife is immune suppressed. I don't have a problem with people who want to wear them. There's And there's nothing in this that says that you can't wear, choose to wear them. It's just that the government shouldn't impose a mandate as as a on on mask wearing as an entree to traveling and because they simply don't have the authority to do it and i think that it's a very important ruling and um, I, i'm assuming that um if this appeal actually takes place 
<laughs> if, it, if they're really going to press this, Leslie, I'm assuming you're going to stay on for the full ride and go all the way up to the Supreme Court with this. Oh, man, we're going to the <laughs> absolute end. Are you kidding? Listen, you know, lightheartedness aside, if we yield this ground, where will else will it go? Let's yep. be clear. You know, they could argue that um, banning big gulps and white sugar and things like this are beneficial to the greater good. And they are. That's the truth. They are. It is not healthy to eat white sugar. It undermines your immune system. It suppresses your immune system for hours after consuming it. So, you know, from a purely public health standpoint, you would think you want to get rid of these things, right? Michael Bloomberg tried to ban big gulps, if you remember, in New York City, he was mayor, and he got shot down. Um, we don't want government having this kind of power or authority. Where does it stop? Where, you know, where is the zone of privacy around us that has already been determined exists by the Supreme Court? Where does it stop? And where, um, how much are we willing to give up? And I am not willing to give up any, basically, because... I've already been medically injured. I know what it's like to have something forced on me or pushed on me that I think has no risk and then be injured by it. And so I will stand and I will fight <laughs> until I have no more fight left because I believe that this is the, one of the most important principles that our country was built on. And that is on sovereignty, that our rights are, you know, our bodies are ours and our rights come from our creator, not from any government entity. Well said, Leslie Manukian and uh, Brent. You're on for the for the for the full e ticket. I'm almost positive here, right? I mean, this is this is going to be a great case to uh, to be arguing if if indeed it gets to the Supreme Court. And I I kind of think that the Department of Justice is going to think twice about this. But if it does get to the Supreme Court, this is one hell of a case to to take there. Right. Yeah. I think what I what I suspect is going to happen is that the man the mandate extension expires on May third. And I think what they're going to try to do from just reading the tea leaves is they might try to uh, tell the appellate court, well, now the case is moot. Uh, please remand with instructions to vacate the opinion of the court below. That's uh, under a, a kind of obscure doctrine of mootness. Uh, I don't think that's going to work for them. And if the 11th Circuit uh, rejects that argument, as I think they should, if it's raised, then uh, they're going to have to face the question of whether they actually want to prosecute this appeal. And uh, that's going to be an interesting uh, sort of inflection point. But we'll see what happens. Not to get too deep in the weeds, but that's what they that's what New York tried with Bruin and didn't work very well for them either. That's a completely unrelated case. But right. that's what New York tried with Bruin and didn't work there either, did it? Uh, no. And uh, the, um, you, you know, it, it's chock full of hazards. I mean, I think we have easily have five votes on the Supreme Court that would support this ruling uh, in some form. And uh, the, uh, you know, this, the CDC could always go back and clean up the APA issues. They may believe that they can clean up the arbitrary and capricious aspect, even though we don't think that uh, there's any way they can cure that. Uh, but I, their, their real concern here is institutional authority and yep. that's what they're hoping to preserve. Brent Hadaway of DavalierLawGroup.com and Leslie Manukian, who's um, leading the charge here from Health Freedom Defense Fund. That's HealthFreedomDefense.org. You can go to those fine websites, find out how you can help. And we're obviously going to keep a very, very close eye on this. But in the meantime, congratulations to you both for a very important win at the district court level. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for Thank having us on. Thanks so much, Ed. Great to be with you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Brant. Stay tuned. We're going to be right back with some more from The Ed Morrissey Show. This is Ed Morrissey of HotAir.com for Town Hall. Courage, C.S. Lewis wrote, is the form of every virtue at the testing point. We rarely see real-world demonstrations of this truth, but the emergence of Volodymyr Zelensky as an inspirational wartime leader reminds us of ancient truths about the value of courage. It also reminds us how far we go astray from cardinal virtues when we live in soft times. In the absence of crisis, Lewis also noted, we lose sight of the value of truth and virtue. New York Times columnist Brett Stevens contrasted Zelensky's heroism with the unserious nature of Western leadership, especially in the U.S. The point's well taken. 
In the absence of existential crisis, we've lost our way. Manufacturing crises, an attempt to redefine truth, virtue, and value. If we want to ensure that we produce leaders with the courage and virtue of Zelensky, we need to reorient ourselves to the cardinal virtues and the promotion of truth. We need to return to those classical values before we, too, face an existential crisis. I'm Ed Morrissey. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Joining us, as always, on our Tuesday podcast, the Prince of Twitter, the Regent of RedState.com, Andrew Malcolm, at A.H. Malcolm on Twitter, and of course, RedState.com. He's a VIP columnist over there. He's got a great column. We're going to discuss that in a minute. But first, we've got to talk about the very clarifying day, Monday, <laughs> when Elon Musk finally bought Twitter. Um... I am Andrew I'm I'm I didn't realize that that a billionaire buying a platform from other billionaires was the end of the world as we know it. I know, isn't that terrible? I was going to buy it, but then when when Elon talked to me, I said, "Hey, you go for it." <laughs> yeah, I was going to try to look under the you know, the couch cushions to see if I had some loose change. Yeah, yeah. Because I I only came within uh, you know a couple of billion dollars of being able to do it myself, but you know, say uh, la vie, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very interesting development, and I look forward to watching what he does. I I was intrigued by his uh, post on Monday that uh, uh, I hope even my worst critics stay on Twitter because that's what free speech is all about. I think that's 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 wonderful. And I just just saw Trump saying he's not going back on. So um, uh, but what what Musk does will be fascinating social media theater, I think. Uh, first of all, I think I think he's, a, he's an interesting guy, and he's done nothing but succeed um, on a big scale. And uh, this is good for democracy. It's not so good for the left, I guess, but uh, maybe uh, they can just take some antacid tablets. So, <laughs> probably a lot of them. Um, you are the prince of Twitter, so this is a great story oh, for yeah. us to lead with, of course. But, um, you know... You talk about being good for democracy and, and, and all of that. There are concerns being raised, Andrew. Concerns, I say, yeah. over the fact that Elon Musk is a, quote, free speech absolutist. And would you like to know which organization is raising those concerns? <laughs> sure. <laughs> The American Civil Liberties Liberty Union, Union. <laughs> <laughs> the ACLU, is concerned about free speech absolutism. I seem to recall that the ACLU is rather absolute about civil liberties as well, including speech up until apparently very recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, democracy dies in darkness, Ed. I guess it does. It dies in, it dies with the smell of musk, the aroma of musk in the air. <laughs> yeah, and he's not even an American. <gasps> he's not American. What is he actually? I'm not sure what Elon Musk is. Well, I don't know if he changed or not, but uh, you know, um, remember Rupert Murdoch had to get U.S. citizenship in order to own American media. So that's right. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so well, I mean. Yeah, there's no FCC involved in 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 Twitter. I, you know, this this to me is, uh, first off, I'm not sure how much this changes anything. I'm sure that Elon Musk is going to do some things differently, right? I, I I'm sure that there, that's the aim. Um, probably is going to loosen up some of the content moderation. Hopefully, is going to follow through on that. But I mean, in the end, Twitter is, <laughs> Twitter is Twitter, and I I don't mean to denigrate your kingdom or your princedom, Andrew, but. <laughs> You know, I, I was uh, a while back, I was asked by some newspapers, some McClatchy papers to uh, do a little coaching class online about about Twitter. And uh, they kept asking me, well, geez, every time I'm on Twitter, I feel like I need to take a shower. And I said, so take a shower. I, I mean, right. If you want to 
if you want to get word out about your stuff, um, Twitter's the place to be. And uh, you don't have to, to uh, what's the word, uh, get involved in all the mud fights. Uh, you know, there are, as, as you, you gave them up for uh, Lent, and by the way, Ed, Lent is over, um, and you gave up trolls, and I think that's, you know, that's fine. You know, who would ever, I just don't see any need to get involved with them, you know? I mean, it's like sitting in the, in the public park, in the public part of a, of a baseball stadium instead of in the family section. And, you know, people drink a lot and, and they get crude. And uh, so you can go to another section or you can complain to the usher or you can just shut up and put up with it. Yeah, nobody appointed us uh, as, uh, as arbiters. And, and isn't that the point of free speech is that uh, you don't have to like it, but you have to allow it. That's the deal. You know, it used to be Voltaire, right? Or at least, you know, a, a, the quote that's often attributed to Voltaire, I don't know how solid the, the quote is, you know, I hate what it is that you write, but I will defend to the death to your the right death, to write yeah. it. Um, yeah. And now it's... I, w I wouldn't defend anybody to the death except my family. But uh, you, you want to say stupid things? Go ahead. The world's going to judge you. Yeah, I mean, now it's... Now it's... Um, you, you're... you're Whatever it is that you got, just got done writing has microaggressed me, and now I'm going to I'm going to report you to the to the official <laughs> yeah. snitches of 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 Twitterdom. I, you know, this is the part that I hope really does stop. Is the, the, this idea that you can that you create these sort of self-reporting content moderation things that people just exploit continuously. Yeah. Uh, to to campaign against people being excluded. I mean, when you're kicking the Babylon Bee off for 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 being a fake news platform, I mean Babylon Bee. If you're not aware what Bab Babylon Bee is, it's a, it's a satirical site. It's supposed to not be true. Unfortunately, the Babylon Bee stuff ends up becoming true uh, anyway. almost accidentally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I tweeted this morning when the word got out about the the purchase, and I, and I said it. One small, one small expensive step for a rich guy, one giant leap for free speech, and yeah. uh, I think it, I think it's great, and then we can just watch it. Uh, it's, it, it's not um, he's not coming in to throw somebody else out; he's coming in to let everybody in. Right. So I don't I don't see the threat there, except. If you want to, if you want to muffle or muzzle uh, people who disagree with you, then that's a guess. That's a threat. But I, I it guess, should be. I guess. I mean, if you're if you're threatened by somebody else being on Twitter, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, you get a life. <laughs> you know, over in Ukraine, you've got people standing up to Russian tanks, right? You got yeah. people. You got people dying by the hundreds uh, in in war crimes and you're concerned that somebody hurt your fifis on twitter i mean I, <laughs> maybe you know I, look i mean this this to me it's just it's a clarifying moment i have no idea what kind of a ceo elon musk is going to be for twitter i have no idea what his commitment is to free speech if he's going to just use it to manipulate speech for his own ends whatever right i what i know is that the status quo sucks and so yeah. There's at least some entertainment factor in there. And you have people who have been railing all day about billionaires controlling uh, yeah, communications yeah. as though they just realized that billionaires own platforms like the Washington Post, the New York Times, Bloomberg, you know, Warren the New Buffett. New York Post, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, the Murdochs own the New York Post and Fox News. You've got uh, Warren Buffett who owns dozens of newspapers through his, you know, investment firms. I mean, it's, this is not new folks. This, and, and, and who is he buying this from? He's buying this from a bunch of other billionaires, yeah. including, including the Saudi government, the Saudi, the Saudi sovereign fund had like a 3% stake in Twitter. That's those are the people who owned it before Elon Musk got involved. I mean, just the Robert Reich, right? 
Oh. Not he's long ago. Yeah, he's very tiresome. Not long ago, he was saying, oh, well, if you don't like the twi- you know, Twitter's content moderation, go start your own platform. Yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah. is the free market at work. Today, Robert Reich. Uh, Musk and his apologists say if consumers don't like what he does with Twitter, they can go elsewhere. But where else can consumers go to post short messages that can reach millions of people other than Twitter? Well, I, I'd say that you had the solution before, Mr. Yeah, Reich. start your own. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have given him the... Uh, he's actually the leading contender. I haven't quite granted it yet, but he's the leading contender for the Judge Elihu Smales Award <laughs> for performative outrage at finding out that the wrong rich guy got into the club. <laughs> The wrong rich guy. That, that's rich. Ed. Well, well, did you you you've seen um, Caddyshack, right? I mean, you you know the yeah. movie Caddyshack. Yeah, that was Ted Knight's character, Judge Elihu Sm- Smales. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, performative outrage at the wrong rich guy getting into the into the club. The yeah. wrong rich guy. Yeah, he's not our rich guy. It's not yeah. our rich guy. Yeah, we didn't have a problem when you know Jack Dor, the you know billionaire Jack Dorsey was running Twitter, or we don't have too much of a problem with Mark Zuckerberg still running Facebook, and we don't we didn't really care when when Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, turned the Washington Post into the Washington Amazon Post. But by golly, <laughs> this yeah, this is an outrage. This is yeah. an outrage. An outrage. How how dare somebody get on you know? Buy buy out stockholders in a uh, in, on a social in, media platform in a free market in a, in free, a market. free market uh, and paying what is it thirty eight percent premium that's that's uh, that's a pretty good outcome for people that have uh, Twitter stock yeah I mean yes it is and look I know that there's a lot of journalists on Twitter which is the reason why they give a damn about this um, but you know Elon Musk didn't buy this to stop getting revenue from it right I mean he's not spending forty three forty four billion dollars on this acquisition to stop getting advertising revenue um neither neither are his lenders (laughs) yeah especially not his lenders morgan stanley isn't gonna isn't gonna sit by idly for that but you know so the advertisers are certainly going to put pressure on for some content moderation i think it's you're still going to see content moderation you're still going to see some sort of mechanisms i think that they'll just be more open transparent and hopefully less biased uh, than they've been in the past. But I mean, you know, this is not the end of the world, no matter how much um, um, people whine. Yeah, people whine. Yeah. It's including the ACLU about free speech absolutism. Yeah, that's amazing. That is really amazing. <laughs> this is the same outfit that defended the Nazis in Skokie, Illinois. And and we're right for doing it, by the way. I Not that I, I mean, I hate the Nazis. <laughs> Right. And I I was disgusted by their their march in Skokie, Illinois, which had a very um, significant um, Holocaust survivor community, which is the reason why the lawsuit came in the first place. But I mean, this is this is the same outfit that defended Nazis in Skokie, Illinois. And now they're concerned about Elon Musk being a free speech absolutist. Uh, (laughs) Yo, Andrew. Yeah. In the. The hypocrisy is it's it, 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 it gets to the level where it's like you, you get tired of pointing it out. It's like, oh, well, everybody is and everybody does or like like Joe Biden lying. So it turns out he really did uh, know a lot about Hunter's Chinese business interests in Ukraine. Um, but do you think any media are counting his lies like they did for Trump? No, no, no. no. It's, it's it's the same kind of political hi- hypocrisy that that we see every day every day online and in the media and it's sad i'm not sure anything can be done about it but if if there is anything can be done it's opening the window and the door on uh on twitter yep. you know i mean was it was the saying on twitter uh if uh if if life closes a door on you open another one that's the way they work <laughs> yeah exactly that's the way doors work and that's the way windows work yeah. let's move on to speaking of doors and windows closing and then opening <laughs> let's uh <laughs> let's move on to um cnn plus we don't have to spend a, a long time on cnn plus but it's worth mentioning cnn plus nonetheless because oh. over the last few days um warner discovery decided that discovered that the idea behind cnn plus was bad and they put an end to it 
And um, you would also, again, think that the world had come to an end, which, you know, to be fair for the people who were working on this, hey, they're working on it in good faith. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to criticize people for complaining about losing their jobs, which is what happened. But, but you know, Brian Stalter was out there saying that this was a corporate decision. It was a, it was a, it was uh, a decision that was based on a, a, a corporate disagreement about the future of uh, about the future direction of CNN and online and apps. And it's nonsense. This got canceled because very few people are going to pay to get CNN soft coverage when they're getting CNN hard coverage as part of their cable package. I mean, it's there. Yeah. It doesn't have a product. There's no there's no reason to buy it. There's no reason for it. And the reason they rushed ahead with it a month before they knew the ownership was going to change um, was because they were afraid it was going to get canceled. And Warner uh, made it come true. Uh, they, apparently, Warner felt it couldn't talk with um, uh, the previous owner about, about uh, hey, don't launch this thing for $300 million because we're going to take it in another direction uh, because for antitrust reasons they didn't own it yet so uh, and I and what I read uh, they're being very generous about uh, signing off and the, the uh, people leaving uh, and finding jobs within the organization uh, and having months uh, to do it uh, at full pay even though they're not doing plus work anymore yep so, yeah, I mean, yeah, most of them are probably going to find a job back in CNN. To, cert to a certain extent, look, I mean, I think I'm a little inured to this because I worked, yeah. I worked in the defense industry. My, my father and my uncles worked in the defense industry, aerospace industry, really. Not so much defense and aerospace. I was in defense, aerospace. They were more just aerospace, aerospace. Um, and you work project to project in those things. It's not unusual to have uh, a project come around and it turns out to to flop or it turns out to go nowhere and the people who signed on to it get cut and sometimes they get reabsorbed and sometimes they don't so it's kind of used to that as a um a, you know as a cycle um but i don't think mike wallace is used to it or chris wallace yeah i don't think chris, chris wallace, wallace yeah. i don't think chris wallace is used to it chris is going to land on his feet first off i'm sure his money's guaranteed right <laughs> oh yeah. I, I'm first off. I'm sure he's unhappy, but I'm pretty sure that a good chunk of his money is guaranteed, Andrew. Um, but um, you know, the people who were you know working on the app, the people who were working on the you know on the 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 content, such as it was, um, those people are going to be out of work, and I feel bad for them. I mean, there's I'm not I'm not gloating about this, but this was this was a fundamental misread at cnn yeah. from the zucker yeah. days and and i think that zucker you know he had a lot of you know he had a lot of loyalty from his staff there but zucker really sent cnn down a rat hole in a number of ways and this was just the the most recent of those rat holes and the most obvious yeah yeah uh and now he's gone too <laughs> so yeah uh, well yeah his departure was uh yeah they were cleaning the house uh, for the new owners. Yeah, his departure was his departure was uh, predicated on some other issues um, uh, that were. Well, that that was the cover story. We, you know, I'm yeah. sure there was a bundle of reasons. To well, that. I don't think he would have survived the, the the merger anyway or the acquisition. They would have brought yeah. their own people in. So, I mean, he was gonna he was gonna be gone no matter what. Um, but um, yeah, well, seeing it for that chunk of change. Uh, they ought to be bringing in their own people. <laughs> and that's what I think uh, um, Musk is going to do. Yep. Yep. I think, again, yeah. I mean, I don't think, that, certainly the board's gone because there's no such thing as a corporate board. Um, if you're, if it's, I mean, you don't, you're not required at least to have a corporate board if there's no corporation. I mean, it's a private entity now. It's going to be Elon Musk's private company. He can, Form a board, I suppose, but he's more, probably just more likely to um, either put himself as CEO or hire or, or hire a CEO that works for him and under his supervision, and you know fill it out that way. I I think that 
I actually think that a lot of the rank and file just stick around. You know, I know that there was a lot of people a few days ago on Twitter saying, oh, I'm, if, he, if he buys it, I'm walking. I'm yeah, thinking... To, to Canada. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, some of the users are doing that. But, I mean, some of the employees apparently were saying, oh, you know, this is... I, I'm, I'm out of here. But why would you want to leave... Why would, you're getting paid to have a front row seat for this transition, <laughs> at least yeah. for a while. I mean, you may as well stick it out just for the experience, right? You can write yeah. about it later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think it would be fascinating, even though you might be facing Armageddon as far as your own personal employment is concerned. But, uh, you know, that's the way capitalism works. Um, yeah. People, some win and some don't. And it sucks to lose, but... <laughs> you enjoyed the ride so right well speaking of enjoying the ride we got to get to your column because this is actually a lot of fun over at redstate.com um i i have been debating in my mind exactly what the asterisks are in this headline i'm <laughs> i'm really sick of old f asterisk 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 s in dc running our country how about you yeah. i am going to say that Farts is uh, maybe the word that you're. you're yeah, some you're... people. Some people thought that was one. Um, there are. There is another. But, uh, Whoa! And, there you go. You're yeah, edgy. Yeah. You're edgy. Yeah, I'm, I'm edgy. I'm edgy. All right. So uh, you know, people can argue over it. As far as I'm concerned, I, I, I just you know, I'm got up to here with all these old timers running the show, in an old timer way and uh, the president doing the senior shuffle across the south lawn i, I just i just so so tired of it uh and uh, the image of a bunny controlling what the president does is just so embarrassing and you know if, if i was in china i'd go okay taiwan's a go they got they got a, a demented guy running the united states yeah, Jess was writing about that earlier today, too. But, um, you know, I, and this is, I think, the problem with um, both parties at the moment, because I, I don't know that Trump's really in, in a front runner position for the Republican nomination. I suspect that um, that's more of a media thing and that when it really comes down to it, voters are going to be wanting to look forward rather than backward. And yeah. they're and they're probably going to want somebody who was born, be, you know, born after the invention of rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> at the yeah. top of their ticket. And um, and I suspect Democrats probably want that as well. And they're stuck with Joe Biden. And, I mean, you point out that you got Bernie Sanders who's talking about jumping in, and he's older than Joe Biden is. You've got, yeah. um, uh, you know, some of the same retreads, you know, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just so tiresome. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just, isn't you know, there anybody it, new? <laughs> well, I there will be. It, a lot depends on the election on November 8th. If, uh, if Ron DeSantis does really well, he'll be uh, atop a field of, of alternates. Uh, Nikki Haley is organizing uh, her pack, and I'm getting messages from her. Big time support for Sarah Palin in Alaska, too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And Trump, um, I, I liked a lot of what he did as president. But you're right about looking forward. He's still talking about the, the election. And uh, you notice his support, while it's still the biggest of anyone in the party, has withered somewhat. And I think by the time, what, 2024 uh, or late 2023 comes around, um, I think people will be looking for something different. And I'm not sure he really wants to do it. He says he does now, but that's good for his business. You know, I get every day probably nine or ten at least messages from, from his crowd. Uh, wanting money, wanting me to buy his book, wanting me to buy a raffle ticket for a dinner with him. Um, and uh, he did, what was it, 100 and, he's got 120 million in the bank. 
Yep. So this is good for business to keep talking about running in 2024. Um, and so, you know, you could make a, a credible argument that he's, he's talking about this this way. He just announced another rally on May 6th in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm sure he will have uh, Dr. Oz there on the platform. Yep. Uh, um, but you could make a credible argument that um, he's milking this for financial reasons. Now, he may end up running again or trying to, but uh, all this talk is turning out an awful lot of money for him. The rallies um, keep him in the news. He'll be on CNN. Um, he's got um, a couple of others on the books now, unplanned on the schedule now. Uh, so it's good business for him to keep at it. Yeah. And I, so I think he will. And I think the longer it goes, and if he continues to keep t complaining about 2020, I think a number of people, given a credible alternative, will peel off. Yeah. And uh, and because uh, he'll be as old then as Biden was when he got the nomination. And uh, I'm not sure people want to sign on for another old timer. No, I, that's, I, I, that I, was I, the point of the column was old timers. Yeah, I, I, and I think you're right. And I think it's just irony, of course, that the podcast version of Waldorf and Statler are, are emphasizing this point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're old, Ed. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shut up. You got it wrong again. Oh, yeah. I, I'm going to I'm going to do my um, uh, Andy Rooney. What is it with this? These old people are running for president. Don't we have anybody who was born after the birth of rock and roll who can do this job? <laughs> God bless Edward, Andy Rooney. <laughs> yeah, you're you're on a roll here. <laughs> don't let me stop. you. This is great. Well, don't let me stop people from going over to um, redstate.com to read this really enjoyable column. And again, um, you should hold like a Twitter poll uh, saying what people think that the F uh, star star oh, yeah, S yeah. star 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 S actually stands for. That's um, a really good idea. There's two yeah. choices. There's two <laughs> choices, folks. Do that on. I'm sure someone will come up with a third. That's even worse. <laughs> that's even worse than the alternative now. Uh, yeah, it could very well be. So, yep. All right. I'm really sick of old F's in DC running our country. How about you? Go read that. Went up on Sunday. It's awesome. And uh, it's a VIP. So you have to be a VIP member. But the reason why we have uh, great content like Andrew Malcolm's uh, and, of course, uh, Julia Rosas over at uh, Town Hall is because of our VIP program. So this is not VIP. You know, so my podcasts are in the clear, but... I get a chance to interview Andrew every every week, even though he is a very important person now. Oh yeah, right. I am, and I've been a very important partner for whatever it is, thirteen years or more, uh, and 14. enjoyed uh, fourteen and and enjoyed every minute. Uh, so, uh, like Trump, I'm going to ride this as long as uh, as long, until I get uh, till I get fired. Right? I'm 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 the same way. <laughs> Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's canned me yet, so I'm assuming that uh, we're we're doing it right. Andrew Malcolm, of course, the Prince of Twitter, and now we come to the to the greatest topic of all, the yeah. jokes of the week, Andrew. Well, okay, well these are all old ones, but uh, we got the Fallon replay. Google spent five million lobbying in the first quarter, uh, which is crazy. You'd think Google wouldn't really need to lobby politicians. All it has to do is say, you know, we have your search history. <laughs> uh, and let's see, a, a Leno replays is good news. Scientists have found two distant planets that may have life just in time, too, since China's about tapped out as our lender. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 more truth than funny. But yeah, 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 exactly. And finally, a Letterman replay. He says, Larry King is divorcing for the eighth time. He now meets Liz Elizabeth Taylor in the finals. Larry has towels marked his and next. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you remember when uh, Sally Quinn, who was a famous feature writer for the Washington Post, and she married the famous editor of the Washington Post, Ben Bradley, uh, and they asked her what this was like, uh, what she was thinking, and she said, well, uh, this is my first marriage and his last. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I I I think that's good for a lot of Americans these days. Well, I don't know about uh, you and Connie, but it was exp it, it was explained to me what death uh, until death do us part meant uh, <laughs> to me by my wife, and uh, it was uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there was, I had um, a woman I knew in Montana. She said, uh, "I may be in prison, but I'll never be divorced." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Andrew Malcolm, of course, the prince of Twitter at A.H. Malcolm on the Twitters is and the regent of Red State with that. Oh, fabulous yeah. Don't comment. forget that. Yeah. yeah, you can't forget the regent of Red State. No, all right, right, Andrew. Thanks for being with us again. We'll talk to you again next week, sir. OK, thanks, Ed. Thanks, everybody. See you then. Stay tuned for more coming up right after this. Thanks for watching the Ed Morrissey Show podcast edition. If you like what you've seen, be sure to subscribe at the channel that you watched on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We love subscribers. More importantly, it lets everybody know that we're out there. So again, thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe.